Let's uh, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 9 through 20. This is God's word. So David set out and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Bezor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men. 200 stayed behind who were too exhausted to cross the brook Bezor. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David, and they gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negev of the Kerethites and against that which belongs to Judah and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Will you take me down to his, this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And when he had taken him down, behold, they were spread ab abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and all the people drove the livestock before him and, and said, This is David's spoil. Last week, we saw the importance of prayer in David strengthening himself in the Lord is God. I believe that what David did, strength, strengthening himself in the Lord, is a wonderful example of what it means to exercise faith, which is so fundamental to our Christian life. So we'll spend some more time analyzing what David did in strengthening himself in the Lord so that we too can strengthen ourselves in the Lord when we feel weak and discouraged in our Christian life. There will be some review, but I hope that we can dig a little deeper into what happened so we can gain some practical wisdom for living out our faith in Jesus Christ. So we'll see why it took David so long to strengthen himself in the Lord and ask for God's guidance and what the Lord did to bring it about and what that means for us. Then we will examine what it means to strengthen ourselves in the Lord and how important prayer is in this. And we'll see how to pray and how not to pray. Last week we saw how David strengthened himself in the Lord and inquired of God what he should do. We don't know exactly what happened in David to strengthen himself in the Lord, his God, after such a long time. He got into this whole mess because he did not inquire of the Lord before he sought refuge in Philistia. We have no record of David seeking God throughout the whole time between his defection to Philistia and this time. Even when he faced the most recent dilemma, caught between arousing Achish's suspicion, which might have meant death for him and his men, and fighting his own people in battle, even then he did not seek the Lord. Why didn't he? Was he not a man after God's own heart? We can guess why. This period of David's life was characterized by deceptions. He took refuge under Achish under the pretense of loyalty to him. And whenever he interacted with Achish, he had to keep up that facade, the shameful mask of hypocrisy. He spoke words of flattery to Achish, mixing in words of self-degradation, and perhaps even words of criticism of Saul, none of which he meant, by the way. And when he came back to his people, he had to become a different person altogether. And behind Achish's back, he raided Israel's enemies. He resorted to unnecessary cruelty by annihilating them, all of them, so he could cover his tracks. And when Achish asked him about his activities, he had to lie again and again. Is it any wonder 
that David could not bring himself to seek the Lord's help. David thought that this was what he had to do to survive, and he had no other choice. When we have no intention of turning away from sin, it is hard to turn to God, isn't it? Just like Adam and Eve, we want to hide from God, not fellowship with him, because turning to God will force us to address our sins in the presence of God. We may not want to repent, or we may not know how to get out of the snare of sin. So we avoid God. And this is why sin is so dangerous. Even a man like David can be blinded by it and kept away from God's fellowship. But even more dangerous is our unwillingness to repent. It is like not wanting to breathe out, letting the carbon dioxide build up in us, which will eventually kill us. I wonder whether this describes some of you spiritually today. That you cannot... Turn to God. You may be able to come to worship God on Sunday, but in your private life, you cannot turn to God in prayer. Or even when you pray, your heart remains at a distance from God because there is a sin that you are not willing to let go. I hope and pray that the Lord will use this tale and this message to alert you to your danger and help you turn around. In repentance. But how do I do that, you may ask. So let's observe what brought about this sudden change in David, strengthening himself in the Lord as God and inquiring of the Lord for the first time in a long time. The Lord showed him the futility of trusting in his own devices. Why did he come to Philistia, the land of his enemies? to find shelter from Saul's pursuit for himself and his men and their families. The shelter he acquired, Ziklag, was now burned to the ground. And the loved ones he wanted to protect by coming to Philistia were all taken away. He did not know where they were and what cruelties they had been subjected to or whether they were even alive or not. This tragic situation compelled David to wake up as if from a dream. By this tragedy, God removed the rosy lens through which David saw his situation, justifying his sinful ways and denying the peril of his conditions. This was not a pleasant experience, to say the least, to wake up from the dream of wishful thinking to a reality that seemed worse than a nightmare. But this view of the nightmarish reality was what David needed so that he could be what he needed to be by the strength of God. We cannot be what we need to be when we are in denial. Some of you may be where David was at this juncture. You have neglected your spiritual life and indulged your sinful desires for a while. And suddenly now, you find yourself standing in front of your ziklag, all burned down. You may be weeping in pain and sorrow, but I want to encourage you, weep, but do not despair. Grieve, but do not grumble. Instead, sing. Praise my soul, the God that sought thee, wretched wanderer far astray, found thee lost and kindly brought thee from the paths of death away. Praise the grace whose threats alarm thee, rouse thee from thy fatal ease. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. It was God's grace that brought you to your ziklag of loss and weeping so you can strengthen yourself in the Lord and regain your true self in Him. 
I'm mindful that some of you are not in Ziklag, Ziklag of Philistia, but in the Valley of Baca, the Valley of Weeping in Israel. Even though you have tried to follow the Lord and serve him to the best of your abilities. But I hope that you can still trust that it is God's grace that has brought you there too. So you can strengthen yourself even stronger in the Lord. But some of you may say that this doesn't help you much. You think that you are not where David is in this passage. You are where David was in the previous passage, living in lies and deceptions, not seeking God. And this story of David confirms for you what you have been thinking. God has to make it happen since you can't do anything about it. Your spiritual stagnancy and backsliding is at least partially God's fault because if God wanted to, he could have cha changed things around for you as he did for David. It seemed like until David came to Ziklag, he could not strengthen himself in the Lord. And you are at that period as David. You don't feel like you can strengthen yourself in the Lord. You keep going in that sinful condition. And you cannot bring yourself to turn to God and strengthen yourself in Him. Then let me ask, you, who may be blaming God for your spiritual condition, are you prepared to go through the kind of nightmare David had to go through to change? If so, you may be terribly underestimating the pain it took to wake up David from his denial. You may be hoping that whatever will cause you to cause your rude awakening will not be so bad. Maybe for some strange reason, you think you can handle the kind of afflictions that came to David. But that is a grave mistake. God knows you. He knows your Achilles heel. And he will strike you there because nothing else will break through the hardness of your heart. He knows the most efficient way of bringing you back. For David, it was the burning of Ziklag and the loss of all of his beloved ones. The point of this story is not to excuse your stubborn unwillingness to repent and encourage you to do nothing until God strikes you with a rod of discipline. What do you think David's message would be for you having gone through all that he went through? Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near to you. Do not be like a horse or a mule that has to be dragged by a bit and a bridle. God placed this story in the Bible so that you would attain the wisdom to turn to God before disasters strike you. God is warning you right now through this message. What does it mean to strengthen oneself in the Lord then? It is somewhat like rejoicing in the Lord. To rejoice in the Lord is to rejoice because of the Lord, on account of the Lord. That is, he is the reason for your joy. So even though we may not see anything in our lives to rejoice about, we will still rejoice because the Lord is there with us. 
So it is to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. I hope it is obvious that this is not something we are called to do when we feel strong and self-sufficient. No, it is precisely when we feel weak, when we feel like we have nothing left in us to go on, that we are to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. I know that many of you can readily agree with this idea and embrace it with gladness as a source of encouragement, and that is wonderful. But I still would like you to consider this. Maybe you can readily accept this as an encouragement because your life is not that difficult right now. You may be doing what young couples in love readily and joyfully do when they make their wedding vow to love and stand by each other, both in good times and bad times, in sickness and health, and on and on. But when their relationship goes through a rough patch, they break their vow and forsake their marriage, saying, I didn't know it was going to be this difficult. This is not what I have bargained for. Is that what? We have to humble ourselves. And not be so proud that, yes, I'm going to make God my strength. I'm going to strengthen myself when I am totally depleted. I'm not belittling your faith. We need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord always. Because we are not as strong as we think. Jesus said we can do nothing apart from him. John 15, 5. All I'm asking you is that you remember this, not just now when things are going okay, but even when you are at the end of your wits and all out of strength. It is for that moment that this encouragement is given to you now. Some of you may have to apply that encouragement to your life now because you are at the end of your rope. You feel totally depleted of all your strength. You have nothing left to give. You feel like Elijah when he cried out to God, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life. 1 Kings 19.4 But you see, where you are is precisely when you are supposed to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. God has emptied you of your strength so that you may be filled with His strength. David wept in sorrow until he had no strength left even to weep. And his men were speaking of stoning him to death. He lost his family. He lost his men too. Even though they were around him, they were now trying to go against him. That's when he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. When God called Moses, he was 80 years old. Shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, not when he was a young prince of Egypt. He was emptied of his strength, influence, and youthful passion so that the power of God might be shown clearly through his weakness. Paul was afflicted with a thorn in the flesh so that God's power may be made perfect in his weakness and God's all-sufficient grace may be demonstrated. So what does it feel like to be strengthened in the Lord? Will we feel a sudden surge of supernatural energy coursing through all our veins? Yes, that can and does happen sometimes. But that is not the only way. Notice how David strengthened himself in the Lord. God wants us to strengthen ourselves by faith. The Holy Spirit can help us to tap into the 60% of the strength we still have left in us, even when we feel like we cannot go on any longer. Remember the Navy SEALs 40% rule? Why do we often feel depleted? It is not because we actually have no strength left, but because we feel discouraged and hopeless. People with physical disabilities can accomplish great things if they have a healthy mindset. But a perfectly healthy body is useless when the mind 
doesn't want to do anything. The Holy Spirit brings us out of that hopeless state by directing our minds back to God. In David's case, the Holy Spirit used the disaster to do it. In other cases, he uses God's word to do it. He is doing it right now for all of us through the preaching of his word. The key is doing everything possible to remember that the Lord is our God because that changes everything. So what if high mountains are blocking our way as long as we can remember that our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth? So what if we stand before Ziklag, our Ziklag that has been burned down to ashes? As long as we can remember that our God turns ashes to diamonds. Strengthening ourselves in the Lord is to hold on to God. By remembering him. And his wonderful attributes. And his glorious works in your life. We may still have many questions about what strengthening ourselves ourselves in the Lord is or feels like. But whatever it may be, it seems like it invariably leads to turning to God in prayer. That is what David did when he strengthened himself in the Lord. It seems that we need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord before we can pray. We have to make up our minds to pray. But it is also through prayer that we receive strength from the Lord. We can see why. Praying is looking to God. Looking to God is more than just casting a glance at God, like glancing in the rear view mirror and the side view mirror before we make a lane change. Looking to God is having a good look at God with a fixed gaze, like a jeweler, jeweler, Examining a large piece of diamond. How long does that take? Taking a good look at God in prayer. 15 minutes? 30 minutes? An hour? Well, it all depends on where you are spiritually. Some of us pray like putting in the order for a takeout meal. We know what we want and need from God, so our prayer is quick and to the point. We are so busy and preoccupied with our concerns and our schedules that we don't even notice whom we are dealing with. God is not a fast food attendant whose job is to take our orders and make sure we get what we want as quickly as possible. God is God, not merely a server. The amazing thing is that out of his infinite mercy, God answers our prayers even when we pray like that. The question is, should we be content with that kind of relationship with God? Living our Christian life that way is like taking a family road trip during which everyone is on his or her device, not talking to one another, not once tearing their eyes off their devices and marveling at the beautiful scenery surrounding us. You may be able to tell everybody that you went, on, you went to the Yellowstone on your family vacation and what you watched on YouTube and Netflix, but you don't have much to say about the grandeur of the national park and how that experience brought you together closer as a family, how sad, all that money wasted, all that time, gone for nothing. To take a good look at God, our prayer should be long enough to go through the thick clouds of our anxious and racing thoughts until we can see the sunshine of God's glory and the blue sky of God's sovereign lordship over our lives. And that's one of the things that I enjoy about flying. 
when you fly through the dark clouds and after a little while you see the glorious vista of the blue sky and the sun shining gloriously. The sad thing is that because we are so busy, we stay under the clouds of anxious thoughts and racing thoughts. We never sit down before God long enough to break, those, break through those clouds to see God in his glory. Brothers and sisters, you have to make that happen. You cannot treat prayer like ordering at a takeout restaurant. You have to be willing to sit down, buckle down, until all of your racing thoughts are gone and you are zoned in on God to experience the glory of that intimacy. This is difficult, I know. Even for me as a pastor, sometimes that's difficult. Because to do this, you need to let go of your life. Nothing less than that. You need to say in your heart, Lord, for this moment, I choose my time with you over all the things I need to do today. Since the chief end of my life is to glorify you and to enjoy you forever, I will take the first step toward glorifying you by seeking you first in prayer and enjoying you through my communion with you in prayer. I believe that this is the wisest and most efficient thing I can do for my busy, stressful life. For I will be lost without you since you are my North Star. I'll be helpless without you since you are my strength. All my labor will be in vain without you since your glory is the goal of my life and all that I do. As Martin Luther said, I cannot pray less than three hours because I'm so busy. How paradoxical, but how true. David inquired of the Lord before he set out to pursue the Amal Amal Amalekites to rescue his beloved ones. Notice also how David did not just pray. Some people pray as a way of escaping their responsibilities. Yes, there are certain things for which all we can do is pray. I hope you have been praying for the pastors and the church leaders that are being persecuted by the government of the Wonderland. Right now, that seems to be the only thing we can do. There may be some things we can do to comfort and encourage them, but there isn't anything we can do to bring about their release, their safety. But were we not reminded that prayer was also the most powerful and effective thing we could do for them? Soon after we were notified and soon after we started praying, we heard about, the, we heard the wonderful news that they were released from the police station even to the pastors and the leaders' surprise. Even they did not expect to be released. The investigation is still going on. So we must continue to pray for them. But God has encouraged us that because prayer is the only thing we can do, it's the least we can do. And isn't this how we feel as we pray for Kathy with her ongoing physical and mental struggles? Do we not feel the same sense of helplessness as we think about those who are going through serious problems in their lives, whether physical, mental, or spiritual? Often we feel bad. I feel bad sometimes when I call Kathy that 
prayer is the only thing I can do. But we should remember that while praying for them may be the only thing we can do, it is not the least we can do for them. In fact, it is the best we can do. Instead of feeling bad, we should strengthen ourselves to pray more faithfully and fervently for them. Again, when I say that prayer is the only thing we can do for them, I'm speaking of their healing. There are many things we can and should do to encourage them and comfort them and help them in some way. But there are many other things for which we should do more than just pray. Notice how David prayed. Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? Verse 8. He did not pray, Lord, please bring them back for us. David could have prayed that prayer, especially since they were exhausted. And the Lord could have answered that prayer in a miraculous way. However, we should question the motive behind such petitions. Are we praying out of our helplessness or for our convenience? You see the difference, right? We can ask the Lord to do something because we are helpless to do it ourselves. But when we ask the Lord to do something for our convenience, we are evading our responsibility and dumping it on God as if he were our servant. David wanted his abducted families back. Even though he was exhausted, he could not deny that he had with him 600 men, though exhausted like him. And he knew that he could not just sit back and do nothing while their families were in captivity, going through who knows what kind of humiliation and cruelty at the hands of their enemies. How are your prayers? Are they for mere convenience to make your life easier? Or are they for real needs? Are you praying because you don't want to do what you are supposed to do? Are you praying for good grades when you are not willing to put in the effort? Are you praying for other people to like you when you criticize everyone? Do you want others to respect you when you do nothing but complain and make excuses? I guess you are seeing where I'm going with this. The prime example, bad prayer, is when we ask God to help us overcome sin without being willing to fight against sin to the point of shedding blood, without removing the sources of temptation, and without applying ourselves faithfully to the means of grace. If God wanted David as men to fight the Amalekites to bring their families back, it is because their battle represented our battle against sin. God is reminding us that sin is something we must fight against. We can't just pray that God will protect us from sinning. What is so great about not sinning because we are prevented from sinning if there is still love of sinning in our hearts? What is so great about not sinning because we, are not, because we are prevented from sinning, because we don't have the opportunity for sinning, when love of sinning is still strong in our hearts? God wants us to grow in holy hatred of sin, not just be content with being forgiven. That is why he wants us to put on the full armor of God and fight against sin. He wants us to fasten on the belts of God's truth against Satan's lies. He wants us to put on the breastplate of righteousness to pro protect ourselves from the shame and humiliation of sin. 
He wants us to put on the shoes of the gospel peace so that we may not get entangled by the snares of sin and its condemnation. He wants us to block the fiery darts of Satan's temptations with a shield of faith before it gets to our hearts and minds. He wants us to wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Brothers and sisters, how can we strengthen ourselves in the Lord if we are not in the Lord? And how can we as sinners be in the Lord without the saving work of Jesus Christ? And what did Jesus have to do so we can be strengthened in God? This passage shows a dramatic contrast between David and Saul, does it not? When David inquired of the Lord, the Lord responded right away, even though David was in this mess because of his foolish decision to defect to Philistia. Do you remember? On the other hand, God remained silent when Saul inquired of him. Feeling desperate, Saul resorted to a medium. Sinning against God even more greatly. That's what sinners deserve, isn't it? That's why for Jesus to pay the penalty of our sin, he had to be abandoned by God in our place. So he was. Even when he cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Brothers and sisters, we are in the Lord because Jesus was forsaken by his heavenly Father. And what a blessing it is to be in the Lord. To have constant access to God if we come to Him in faith. If we just call out to Him, God will answer us because we cry out to Him in the name of Jesus Christ. And if we are in the Lord, we can be strengthened in Him. How? Paul said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. In the same way, though Jesus was all powerful, yet for our sake he became weak, so that we by his weakness might be strengthened with his power. Let us acknowledge our weakness so that we might be strengthened by his power and mount up with wings like eagles to the heights of heaven on that glorious day. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we give you thanks and praise for the glorious privilege that we have to have your audience in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we are in the Lord through faith in Jesus Christ. And because we are in the Lord, we can be strengthened by his power and might to accomplish what we cannot do on our own. Lord, Help us to recognize how rich we are in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to be sorrowful that we have wasted so much time not praying to you, not looking to you, 
to be strengthened by you. Lord, there are those who are exhausted, who don't feel like they can, they can, they can, who feel like they cannot go on any longer. Lord, would you use this message through the power of your spirit to help them strengthen themselves in the Lord because they are powerless. And even those who are not in that place, would you please, Lord, help us to know that apart from Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. And help us, Lord, not to rely on our devices like David. Help us, Lord, before our ziglag is burned, help us, Lord, to turn to you in humble reliance and experience the power of the Holy Spirit to make our work effective in glorifying your name and serving your people. Bless us, O Lord, as we look to you in faith. And I pray that in, in this coming week, all of us will experience the joy of being strengthened in the Lord. In the midst of our challenges, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.